If you're a neural networks student or professional, then you're probably fascinated with what's the next big thing in neural networks. Where are we going to see the emergence of something that's very new and different? If you've been with me for the past few vids, you know that we've been establishing the framework for a new neural networks class. And in this vid, we're going to assemble that framework in a much more cogent and workable manner so that you can get a very clear understanding of exactly where we're going to see this new neural networks class appear. Welcome in. I'm Aliana J. Marin, speaking to you from Themesis, from the beautiful island of Kauai, which is where we have our corporate headquarters. Now, let me tell you this in story form. Suppose that you have a fascination with treasure hunting and that the great love of your life is to look for treasures that have been lost at sea. Suppose that you're in your favorite seaside tavern and you're talking with a few chums and you start talking about a treasure that was lost at sea and you realize that you've got just enough in the way of clues to be able to go after it. Specifically, you've got a sense of what the sea route was for this particular ship that went down. Second, you've got in your hands on a map that shows you roughly where this treasure might be found on a given island. And third, you've got a journal, which is giving you the clues as to what was going on during sea voyages that were a lot like the one where the treasure was lost. Now, in a previous video, and the links to this are in the blog post associated with this vid, and you'll get that blog post link in the description box below. In that previous vid, we introduced a triangulation in towards this new neural networks class. There were three paths on this triangulation. We described that first path as phylogenetic etymology of neural networks, meaning the historical evolution of neural networks networks, and by looking at this, we'd find certain breakpoints where a new neural network class might emerge. The second approach was to look at problem statements in the very classic, well-known papers where they carefully identified what the issues were that needed to be addressed. And then the third, where we gave most of our time, was something called the matrix. Actually, we looked at the logical topology of neural networks based on work done back as far as 1991, and we examined the key features of both major neural network classes as well as various machine learning methods. So in this video, we'll pull these three paths together, and we'll start by looking at the matrix, otherwise known as the logical topology of neural networks. We're going to look for key features that characterize these networks and that can be used to cross-compare across the different neural networks, as well as machine learning methods. So referencing back to our treasure hunting story, identifying the essential concepts that characterize these different neural networks and machine learning methods is like building up a map of the ocean floor. Now we actually expanded the number of classes that we're considering because in our last vid on natural language processing algorithms, we addressed several distinct methods. Let's start with that first row going across and check off a few boxes. First, we notice that everything that is a true neural network obviously has nodes or neurons. That includes the first several classes from simple NLPs, restricted Boltzmann machines, deep learning and GANs, up to and including CNNs, convolutional neural networks, and also LSTMs, long short-term memory networks. Now we'll jump over the next three columns and take a look at GPTs and large language models. And yes, those are neural networks. The transformer on which those are based is a neural network. Let's go back and take a look at the LDA method or latent Dirichlet allocation. It's a beautiful method, but it's not a neural network. We're Tovec and BERTS, bidirectional encoder representation from transformers, however, are both neural networks. Word to Vec is a shallow neural network, and BERTS are both based on Word to Vec and also use transformers. Finally, our inference planning decision-making methods, that is, reinforcement learning, variational methods, and active inference are not neural networks. Now that we've established what is a neural network and what isn't, let's take a look at our second really important characteristic, whether or not a system works with latent variables. Now, all the major neural networks, of course, work with latent variables. As we established in the previous two YouTubes, the introduction of latent variables into a neural network architecture was what made it powerful and effective. Naturally, CNNs and LSTMs also have latent variables. Let's quickly look at three of the NLP methods, word to vec BERT, and GPTs, or the overall group of large language models that use transformers. These all, of course, involve latent variables. Just as an example, word to vec and similarly doc to vec encode words or documents, depending on what you're dealing with, into a vector where the vector fields represent the latent variables themselves. 
Now we go back in this matrix and take a look at LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation. And yes, the name itself kind of gives it away. The LDA method definitely includes latent variables. In fact, in LDA, the topics that are generated are themselves the latent variables. Finally, we take a look at our three favorite inference planning decision-making methods, reinforcement learning, variational methods, and active inference. Now, the variational and the active inference methods definitely do involve latent variables. They are built around discovery of latent variables, specifically parameters for a model. Reinforcement learning, though, is another matter. It intrinsically does not involve latent variables. There are some instances of combining reinforcement learning with, for example, deep learning. This is a hybrid approach, though. It isn't intrinsic to the nature of reinforcement. Let's take a moment, pause, and assess where we are and what we're going to do to wrap this portion of our work up. In reference to our earlier example of a sonar-based depiction of the ocean floor, we're making progress. This is, of course, a time-consuming and somewhat tedious process, but by the end, we'll be able to lift up those fundamental notions and ideas that are key to AI as we know it today. Now, to speed things up a bit, we're going to consider four of the essential concepts at one time. That is the notions of Bayesian probability, Markov decision processes, gradient descent, and the kullback liebler divergence. Now, our job here is to go big picture. We're not after every possible little nuance or subtlety. So, for example, with Bayesian probability and simple MLPs, for example, using backpropagation, we could, if we wanted to, put down a little itsy-bitsy tiny check mark because there is a connection, obviously. But Bayesian probabilities are not the first thing that we think about when we start deriving backpropagation using the chain rule. However, Bayesian probabilities are intrinsic to the Boltzmann machine and all of its derivatives. Markov decision processes, in this case Markov random fields, are also intrinsic to the Boltzmann machine and therefore also to its derivatives. Gradient descent is, of course, intrinsic to multilayer perceptrons and thus also to all the neural networks that make use of gradient descent backpropagation or involve a multilayer perceptron in their architecture. Gradient descent is also used in the NLP algorithms word to vec BERT, the GPTs and all LLMs, and all the various associations and descendants. Now let's give our attention to the KL divergence, or kullback liebler divergence, which is very much a theme throughout neural networks and inference planning decision-making methods. By suitable origami folding of the KL divergence equation, we arrive at an equation that looks very much like a statistical mechanics free energy equation, which is why the KL divergence is so often used to introduce STATMEC into neural networks, specifically energy-based neural networks, as well as the inference methods. So we return to the matrix and check off a few boxes. First, everything having to do with an energy-based neural network, restricted Boltzmann machine, and all of its descendants. And then also, we're going to extend our consideration out to the inference methods and check off variational methods and active inference. Now, since we've shifted our conversation to the inference, planning, and decision-making methods, let's take a further look at what goes with what. The variational methods, including active inference, consider how to form their latent variables. They do so using Bayesian probabilities. When it comes to the concept of Markov decision processes, well, reinforcement learning is built around that. So our last question in this row is, do variational methods and active inference use Monte Carlo Markov chains? And the answer is, hmm, they really try to approximate that. The variational methods are viewed as fast, and a Monte Carlo Markov chain approach is viewed as very slow. Now, before we go on to statistical mechanics in those bottom two rows, let's mop up a few things in the language and text columns involving latent Dirichlet allocation, word to vec BERT, and the various LLMs. Let's first look at LDA and ask, does this method use Bayesian probabilities? The answer is definitely yes. Does LDA use the kullback liebler divergence? Again, yes. It's worth noting, and we pointed this out in the predecessor vid, that the LDA algorithm was invented by Bly, Ying, and Jordan, and that Bly was the lead author on a follow-up paper on variational inference. There's a strong connection between the notions of variational inference and LDA. Finally, we revisit the last three 
NLP algorithms were Tuvec, BERT, and the LLMs based on transformers, and ask, do they intrinsically use Bayesian probabilities? And the answer is, it's a little more implicit than explicit. We'll give those small checks. Do they use the KL divergence? Not quite. And they're not Markov processes either. Finally, rounding this out, we ask, does reinforcement learning use the callback liebler divergence? In recent work, yes. Does it use Bayesian methods? Again, recently, yes. Small checks. And we'll go back and adjust that reinforcement learning and latent variables connection, allowing a small check mark. So we have our matrix filled out through all except those last two rows. And those last two rows involve free energy, both in its more basic form and in terms of statistical mechanics. The reason that we make that distinction is that really statistical mechanics isn't the right abbreviation. Really what we're talking about is whether or not we are using the icing model, in which case we specifically allocate a unique connection weight to each connection between a visible and a hidden node. This is fundamental to all of the energy-based models. Now we similarly use statistical mechanics in transformers and anything that derives from or uses transformers transformers. This includes all the LLMs as well as BERT. As we mentioned in the previous vid, transformers essentially take the simple nodes that we use in the icing model and make them much more complex, allowing them to be vector valued instead of scalar. Now finally, variational methods and active inference definitely use statistical mechanics. They are all about minimizing that free energy equation. Well, that was a bit of a job, wasn't it? So for those of you who hung in there with me on that very long process of building up the matrix. Thank you for staying with me. And for those of you who sk skipped ahead and are joining us now, welcome back. So the question is, what are we going to do with this? We have what amounts to our allegorical sonar map of the ocean floor. That is, we know the terrain. And so what are we going to do with this in order to create the next new thing? Now, we've got the word from a number of AI luminaries that a new thing is very much desired and wanted. Hinton, for example, talking about starting all over. And Sam Altman, in reference to the transformer-based large language models, is talking about something different. What does that really mean? First of all, we're not that likely to totally abandon the things that have worked well in the past, dominantly latent variables. As we saw from this matrix and also from the preceding bit and the one prior to that, every time we had a major neural networks breakthrough, it involved getting a latent variable in there. Now, we'll put that on our list of things that we probably want to keep. In addition to that, probably we're going to make you some, some sort of Bayesian capabilities because in essence, those latent variables talk about probabilistic dependence. The next big thing that shows up as a really dominant topic is the use of statistical mechanics in some form or other. Either a simple icing equation for the Hinton style energy-based neural networks, the Boltzmann machines and all their derivatives, or taken up a level into transformers, or less explicitly oriented towards interactions between nodes and more a description of the overall probability distribution of some sort of model versus some data set that you get in doing variational inference, where we're doing inference in order to obtain the latent variables that are the parameters. However we do this, the notions from statistical mechanics seem to play. And there's a reason for this. Let's just take a moment here. Statistical mechanics, and when particularly we talk about the icing model, we're using it to describe a system in a most simplistic manner possible. It's a toy model. It's based on the notion of having point particles that have no mass, no volume. They bounce around in some sort of volume, or that's if they're a gas, or they have other behaviors if they're solid or liquid. And what we're trying to do is model their behaviors. And the icing model works beautifully well for that. The surprise is that it works so well when taken over to the neural networks arena where it has no physical correspondence. It works amazingly well there too, because we do get a minimum. We solve that contrast of divergence to find a free energy minima that allows all these different patterns to be recognized. The reason for that is the entropy term. When we take a look at the entropy for a simple icing model, we said that the entropy is that nice, round, convex shape, and it's easy to identify a minima. And then the other terms, the enthalpy terms, the interactions and the activation energies, they just sort of move that minima back and forth. 
very well behaved. And that's such a nice characteristic that we're able to get solutions when we take this into the contrast of divergence mechanism. Similarly, because that equation is so characteristically well behaved, when we take it into other areas of neural networks, NLP, uh, variational inference, we get good behaviors. That's why that particular equation has been so tractable. But there's another reason. In the nature of the universe, free energy is a dominating principle. That is, that balance between the enthalpy and the entropy, finding that minimal free energy equilibrium state, that's a, a truism of nature, much as Newton's laws of mechanics are true. It's one of those things that makes the world glue together, so to speak. So it's not surprising that this whole equation becomes very relevant and interesting. So let's consider hanging on to that one as well. So we've got some ideas for what we want to carry forward from things that have worked well in the past into what we might want to use in the future. Now let's take a look. We're we've worked out our matrix, okay? This is like finding where on that ocean floor some lost ship might have gone down and what the terrain was, uh, what the mountains were emerging on islands around that, where the wind might have blown something off course. In other words, we've got our terrain, we've got our courses figured out. Now we're going to be more particular. For that, we go back to that phylogenetic etymology, meaning the history of neural networks, and we're going to take a look at something that we started to identify three videos ago. And that was when we began looking at what was a Kuhnian breakthrough, what was not. And here's the thing. Some things are major league breakthroughs. And an example of that would be when Paul Wurbus developed the back propagation method. That let a very simple neural network become the very effective multilayer perceptron. Another example, oh, I'm just picking them somewhat at random here, but the k-means algorithm, beautiful but limited, and then Bly, Ying, and Jordan introduced the latent Dirichlet allocation, basically introducing latent variables, and all of a sudden it becomes very powerful. Let's go back a little bit to Hinton and the early introduction of the Bolson machine, which was introducing latent variables. And then it took a while, I think it was about 16 years, before he came up with contrast of divergence. Now, the contrast of divergence was an implementation algorithm. Everything after that, creating all the deep learning architectures, implementations, or combinations of things. Deep learning methods tend to use a combination of backpropagation along with a contrast of divergence. GANs use a combination of discriminative architectures, the multilayer perceptrons, together with a Bolson machine. In other words, those things play together. Those are not quite the same order of conceptual breakthrough as we had with Hinton's early work when he evolved the first instance of a Bolson machine. So we're going to partition our diagram and identify that the likely place for a path that was not yet traveled is up near the originating works and not down in the implementations or the works that are based on combining two or more mechanisms. When we go up there, we take a look at that breakpoint there's this interesting thing that happens. We look at that 1986 time frame. That's when Smolensky introduced the notion of removing some connection weights and creating something that was isomorphic to an MLP. And underneath that, there was another work that I haven't shown here, haven't discussed. So 1988, Gorman and Sejnowski, one of the first investigations on finding an optimal number of neurons in the hidden layer in a multilayer perceptron. Beautiful work. It set a tone. This was one of the first well-known studies to look at the numbers of hidden neurons that were needed, and it led to a series of investigations over the years by many researchers. It was somewhat like Mama Bear in the Goldilocks story, that you didn't want too many, you didn't want the Papa Bear, you didn't want too few, the Baby Bear, you wanted a middling amount, the Mama Bear, that was just right. A multilayer perceptron, or the equivalent Bolson machine architecture. Too many hidden neurons, and you get the problems that every first-year student in neural networks learns. That is, you have neurons that specialize in learning just one thing. They don't generalize at all. Or neurons that are lazy, they never train. Or neurons that learn the same thing, so that you get duplication. And 
too few and you don't have enough neurons to learn all the necessary features. So there's a sweet spot. It's in between them. We learned early in our game doing neural networks that this sweet spot was the highly desired position and that we really didn't want to go into a huge number of extra neurons because that would just, they were superfluous. They wouldn't do us any good. That is the break point. Because something happened right around there where we, where we evolved a very linear kind of neural network architecture where everything was strictly and severely functional. Now, we're not going to go very far along this line today. We're just going to mention a couple of things that are relevant and interesting. First of all, when we take a look at the kinds of neurons that are the basis for neural networks, they're extremely simplistic, right? I had the good fortune of studying years ago with Carl Prebram when he was the director of the Brain Research Lab in Radford University in Virginia. Brilliant man. Every lecture of his was full of ideas that could have each led in years of productive research. One of the things that he emphasized was this notion of simple neurons that spike and then you send down the action pulse along the axon and it excites another neuron and so forth. That's a little bit too simplistic. He was fond of presenting the notion of dendrodendritic connections. He was very much in tune with the notion that the connections between neurons could be mediated by the chemical bath in which they were situated. More recently, there's been a greater emphasis on the behaviors of groups of neurons, specifically things like avalanches of neurons. This notion of neural avalanches is often described using something called power law distributions, meaning you can have small groups of neurons activated for a short period of time. Those are by far the most common and very, very large groups of neurons activated for larger term larger time frames are less common and a power law distribution describes how there's m much more frequent activation of small groups short durations versus the large groups long durations key thing here is activations of groups it's a dynamic behavior now there also happens to be some good physics that describes this kind of thing so we wouldn't be starting from scratch the question is are we really ready to jump into something like neural avalanches Maybe not yet. At the same time, maybe it's time to look at something that gives us dynamic behavior. So on that note, we're going to close for now. Pick up on this theme in the next video. Until then, we'll see you soon. Once again, Aliana Moren for Themesis. And by the way, be sure to look at the blog post. We link to it in the description box below. And that will give you links to all the various things that we're discussing. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Have a lovely day. To ensure that you get invited to the next episode of this great adventure, be sure to subscribe to us on the Themesis YouTube channel. Go to the Themesis.com website and opt in in order to get emails telling you about new blogs, YouTubes, and special events and opportunities. Thanks again. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.